Yes, so this is the second part about the historical ciphers. In the first part, we've been looking into Cedar cipher, Visionaire cipher, and one time head. And now we're going to be looking at some more, um, also very common ciphers that you can do by hand and where you can impress the birthday party or a partner at the bar. It. Uh, do not ever use those in real world unless you want people to break them. So the first one we're going to look at is the Playfair cipher. Um, it's kind of cute in how it is playing with the letters of the alphabet and it's just permuting them in a way that is a lot larger from the number of key combinations than what you see in the Cedar cipher. It's not getting the full 60, uh, 26 factorial as we see in the moment, but it's getting a lot closer to it. So it's using a keyword similar to how Visionaire is working, and it turns this keyword into a 5x5 five five grid of letters. What it does is it starts at the top left corner and fills in those letters of the keyword five, at a, I mean, five per rows in such a way that each letter appears only once in the grid. Now, if you have a letter appearing twice, you're just ignoring the second one. Also, the 26 letters of the current Latin alphabet don't really fit into a five by five grid, and that's why I and J are identified. Now, if we see secret as the keyword, then the E is a repetition there. So the first five uh, characters will just be S, E, C, R, well, not the E, but then the T. At the end of the keyword, there are a whole bunch of letters of the alphabet which haven't been used, and you then insert them in the order in which they appear. So the first one, Letter A hasn't appeared yet, so we next put an A. B, well, C has already appeared, so we don't put a C. D, yes, E has already appeared, and so on. So we just fill up the remainder of the 5x5 five five grid in a left to right top down motion. So the first thing we notice is that we're skipping the E in secret, and then also we're skipping the C when we get to it in the alphabet because it is part of the keyword. We're skipping the E when we get to it in the alphabet. So there's only A, B, D, and then E is skipped again, F, G, H. I is equal to J, so there's just one of them, we typically write I, and so on. So this fills exactly the grid. If you have any letters left, then something went wrong earlier. You can also see that, or I was saying that it's not really 26 factorial because, I mean, of course, if your keyword is very long, if you have something which is basically running through all the letters of the alphabet. If your keyword is the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, um, you're hitting all the characters. On the other hand, everybody would be using that one sentence, at least if they're speaking English, because that's the stereotypical English sentence if you want to hit all the characters of the alphabet. So if you don't, then very likely the last corner is a Z. And since the key is carrying everything all the information, all the secrecy here, um, if that last piece is known, then you're already giving away some information. Now to explain how encryption works, we first have to go one extra step, namely we have to pre-process the message. Um, Playfair encrypts pairs of letters, and they have to be such that each pair of letters has each of them being unique, so you can't have repetitions. So what we're doing is we're taking well, here, hello, Bob, starting from the left, splitting off two letters, so HE is our first pair, and then we encounter double L. Now, double L is two characters of the same type, so then the rule is, if we encounter that, we insert an X, and then we continue. Okay, so then there's an LX, and then LO, and then Bob. Well, there's a B at the end. It's a single letter. And so if there's a single letter left, then you also put an X there. So that's the final encoding. So this is not the encryption yet, but it's just an encoding. And if you see this, and if you're reading this, well, you're getting to H-E-L-X, and then you have to think, okay, is this likely to be actually an X that I want to have there, or is this, oh, let's go with the next character, the next character is an L. That makes it fairly likely the X wasn't supposed to be there. Also, oh yeah, I can read this as hello. And so the encoding gives away that I probably, I mean, the decoding will say, okay, I probably entered an X in the encoding, so let's do this better. 
And so here's also an example of something which would have had even length. So we would say, hey, if you split it up in pairs, it's an even parity, so we don't need an x at the end. But because we had an n turn x between the two l's, we also got an x at the end. Well, let's jump right in on how the encryption works. So on the right, I'm going to have our um, keyword again, uh, sorry, our keyword expanded to the whole 5 by 5 grid. And then the cases for the encryption are if the two letters, so at this time L and H and E, if they appear in the same row, then do something. If they appear in the same column, then do something. And the third case is the most common one, namely that they appear neither same row nor same column. So H, E, I've highlighted this in blue up there, they do not appear in the same column or row. And then the rule says, if the two letters span a rectangle, all right, so we have the H and the E spanning this blue rectangle, then the encryption is, we encrypt each of these two letters to the letter in the same row in opposite corner. So this one goes here and this one goes there. So H, E turns into I, S. All right, was fun, let's do this again. So LX, we're finding LX over here. And then, well, again, it's a rectangle. And so L turns into K and X turns into Y. And then LO, ha, now we have an interesting case. This is the middle case. So we have both of them being in the same column. And then the rule is each of them goes down one position from where it was. So the Bob, the B, goes down to I, and the O goes down to W. So we're turning BO into IW. And then finally, BX is again a rectangle. Now when you're decrypting, you have to reverse this procedure. So when you're decrypting, you're finding DW, you're spanning this rectangle, you're finding the other corners, and that gives you the BX. And of course, after you decrypt, then you still decode, so you're removing the inserted axis. So Playfair, at first it seems there are lots of combinations of how you can have those 25 letters appear. So it looks like 25 factorial, but because the remaining letters are filled in in the order they appear, depending on how long a keyword is, Z and even X, Y, Z is probably always at the right at the bottom corner. So if you see an X, then you know it was one of the other letters in the bottom row, fairly likely. And fairly like the other letters in the bottom row include W, V, Y, and Z. So that's all I want to say about this cipher. Um, the Hill cipher is getting us more into mathematics. So this is something which is using matrices, and there is one system parameter n. For our examples, we're always going to use small n, but the n can be larger if you wanted to. It uses um, numbers instead of letters, so we're just encoding letters from a to z as the numbers 0 to 25, and so that then all operations are taken multi 26. So that is the same as when I was doing the Caesar cipher and I was having these circles with the flankies on the outside, ciphertext on the inside. The last of those, of those that I showed was showing you the, well, we're translating them to 0 till 25, just so we can do the shift as an addition. Now here the encryption works differently. We're turning our, uh, our cipher, our plain text into each letter turns into a number between 0 and 25. And the secret key is a n by n matrix. So a matrix is a grid, so they are n positions in this direction and n positions in this direction. So this n by n grid, and each of them is an integer model 26. You should know this notation from previous classes. So these are just taking the remainders by division, the, the remainders when you divide by 26. And then a matrix is invertible if you can find another matrix, well, again, n by n, so that the product of those has just ones on the diagonal and everything else is zero. One requirement for that is that the determinant is non-zero. And since it's module 26, it's even a requirement that the determinant has to be invertible module 26. So remember what it means to be invertible. So that is that the GCD of that number and 26 is 1. 
and uh, I have a link coming up to a short video on explaining how we actually can compute these inverses. But first, let's do the constructive way of how we encrypt our plain text. So we're taking this vector of n letters, and each of them being an integer mod 26, and then we're multiplying this message m by the matrix. Um, message m we're transposing, it means going for a column vector, times the matrix that our secret is. And that gives us the ciphertext as the output. And then the decryption, well, if you wouldn't think of s as a matrix, but just as an integer, then if c is s times m, then, well, flip things around, then m equals s inverse times c. Just multiply from by s inverse from the left. Now, in our case, this s inverse is actually this complicated things where you need the determinant of the matrix and need to ensure that it's inverted mod to 26. So what we use on the way to that is the extended Euclidean algorithm, and there's a link on the slides where you can find more about it. Now, in this case, it's a nice big key space in all of that, but all the encryptions are linear dependent. So if you're getting n decryptions, if you're getting n plaintext ciphertext pairs, then you can figure out everything that's in the matrix. And uh, if you're doing the exercise sheets for the, uh, for the course, then this was one of the examples where I showed you how we can decrypt it, so how we can figure out how it works just by knowing plaintext ciphertext pairs. Column transposition is another one of these uh, old systems. So here is actually the instruction of what you're supposed to do as an example. So what we're doing is we write the text in fixed width row, uh, in fixed width rows, the permutation, and then permute the columns. Okay, so well, the fixed width here is seven columns. So we're writing the text in these seven columns. And then the key are the red numbers on top. These red numbers say a permutation of the numbers 1 to 7. So they're not in the correct order. But what the encryption is doing is it's writing those in the correct order. So it's taking the first row and then taking the number 1 thing here. So this is where we have a T in column 1, so that gets moved over here. We have another T in column 2 that gets moved over there. And then column three has the W here, and so on and so forth. And we don't just do this with the first row, we actually do this with all the rows. Now, when you see it like this, you do know which is the first column. There's one of them which is longer than all the others. So if you would be seeing this as the output, and depending on which instructions you follow, this might actually be the ciphertext, you're giving away that column three was the initial column in the original in the original plain text. But what you're actually supposed to do is take this new text and read it the same way from left to right, top to bottom, that you had entered the text in, but now with the columns permuted. So when you read this out, then the first block is just, um, I'm sorry, you're reading it out as the length of the columns, not as the length of the rows. So then one of them is longer, but you do remove the spaces. So this is then actually the proper encryption. Um, if you enjoy these, um, here's another link in addition to the ones which I already had on the home page. In particular, the column transposition is pretty rarely found in any of the online tools. So I want to give a shout out to this page where they have a nice tool where you can play with these as well. Now, a crypto course would not be complete without talking about rotor machines, but I can't really give them justice in just one lecture here. And so what I would instead do is encourage all of you to go to the Crypto Museum. Um, it's an online web page, but the guys who are running it are actually sitting in Eindhoven. And if it wasn't for COVID, I would highly encourage you to uh, get in touch with them and say, hey, can we visit at some point? Um, we also have some machines from them on show. So in the meta form, well, you can't go right now. But once this is open again, we have a gray tag machine. Uh, ben de Vera owns a haggling machine. So there are some of those uh, old-fashioned rotor machines that are very close to where you are studying. And um, we had some, ex uh, some events where they actually brought in a real enigma and people could touch it and push on the buttons. Now, 
That picture here is showing the Enigma. And what you see there is a keyboard. There's this middle row that's actually there where the keys go. You can push on those buttons. Behind that is a row where the same letters are and these would light up. So it would show which letter it gets encrypted or decrypted to. And then the front, that's where these plugs go that change or that re um, reflect the current coming through. So what happens when you push a key is that it goes through a system to, uh, in the back there are three rotors. It goes through all of those and these are advanced. It then goes through the plugs, gets reflected, and then goes back to the rotors to another letter. And that's then the encryption of that letter. If you push the same letter again, it will not encrypt the same letter because the rotor settings have advanced. The way that these rotors advance is pretty much like a speedometer in a car. So um, it goes like one higher and it flips each time. So it's like a kilometer counter. So it goes here until it reaches 10 and then it flips the next one. So this goes back to zero, so it's one higher there. Except for here you have the letters of the alphabet. But let me really uh, stop here on this one and encourage you to go to the Crypto Museum um, and read up on the pages. You can see here already a little bit of the starting page. You see on the glossary that they have a lot more about rotor machines and then also a huge amount of detail about the internals and how to attack them. So that's all I wanted to say about rotor machines. Um, next up is some more modern crypto. So see you around for that.